Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to episode number 50-something, 50 uh, 57 of the Nautel Transmission Talk Tuesday webinar series. There were a couple of weeks where I had that episode number just dialed right in, but uh, nope, we're gone scatterbrained and we're losing it again. Uh, just a quick shout out, Jerry Higgins said, welcome all and present uh, first in on the uh, comments. Uh, Elaine Jones says, oh, two of her favorite people today. So that'd be Mike and Ed, of course. I'm Jeff, I'm your host. Uh, and as always, we're going to have some fun today. We're going to talk about stuff that, uh, so the title may be a little misleading if you don't know what we're talking about, but we are talking about MDCL. And uh, again, in my habit of finding somebody smarter than me to talk to, we got uh, the VP of Business Development for Orban Labs, Mr. Mike Pappas, who is coming to us from a hotel in Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. Right, Mike? That is correct. I'm here at the lovely Weston Hotel in downtown Chicago on the 14th floor. See, now the, the, the VP of Business Development gets a Weston Hotel in Chicago. I usually end up in a La Quinta out in LaGrange. So... Uh... <laughs> That tells you a little bit, of, yeah, there you go. Frugal, that's my word of the day. Um, anyway, having said all that, uh, we got the mandatory housekeeping stuff uh, as soon as I remember how to advance a slide on this thing. Uh, if you're new to one of these, then uh, we try to keep them as interactive as possible. Uh, type in your question, hit the send button, it'll pop up on the window. I've been addressing it already on my screen and uh, we'll uh, answer it uh, as it uh, fits into the conversation. I try not to leave anybody ignored. If I do, that's on me and I apologize in advance. If you've got a microphone and you're not shy, hit the little hand wavy icon, we'll unmute you and make you part of the conversation. That said, let's get rolling. So Mike, MDCL and AM radio. And by the way, I, I stole a bunch of Mike's slides for this, but Mike has no idea what's gonna hit the screen. So we try to keep this as uh, spontaneous as possible by not letting even our guests know what we're talking about. Well, thanks, but, Jeff. So uh, <laughs> this was a, a, Jeff borrowed this from a presentation I did for the Radio Club of America about uh, the week of uh, Thanksgiving. And uh, they were, uh, the subject matter was uh, uh, MDCL for uh, AM, and uh, we started off by talking a little bit about uh, uh, AM is probably one of the second uh, oldest uh, forms of uh, modulation outside of spark gap and uh, CW, and it's been around for almost uh, 100 years, and it's uh, it's pretty simple and easy to implement, and it's very simple and easy to receive, so it. Uh, it, it, it kind of works. I would guess that's probably the easiest thing to say about it, Jeff. It is. And I mean, the cool thing about it is you don't need a whole lot of uh, electronics training to, to slap together an AM receiver. And this is a schematic that you had posted. And uh, as I say, I cheerfully plagiarize. Well, and Jeff, you know, I think uh, there were a lot of us that got started in broadcast. You know, my dad made me a crystal radio set. And, um, you know, we had a long wire antenna and a ground, and I listened to WTMJ, which is uh, in Milwaukee, 50 mm -hmm. kilowatt with a with an earphone and, uh, and that uh, crystal radio set. And that's how I got hooked uh, in broadcast. Another soul lost in broadcast from a crystal radio set that didn't require any power uh, listening to your local AM radio station. So a million years ago, actually, holy smokes, it was 50 years ago, I got a uh, Radio Shack home electronics kit. You remember those little ones? He had the little yeah. red box with the metal clips that acted basically like a exposed breadboard, if you will. And uh, one of the projects in that was a cat whisker diode uh, receiver. And so I kind of got started on FM reception and then discovered AM after, because AM was cool. They had me wind the antenna for the receiver. And, and that was really neat. So, so yeah, same deal. You know, 50 years ago, I got the, this thing from, even if my parents had known then what they know now, they probably would have second guessed that gift and got me, I don't know, a home banker kit or something. <laughs> but uh, yeah, maybe well, game of operation. Um, <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> They still yeah. make that game, by the way. I know they do. I've got a 12-year-old in the house, so yep. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it, it's just one of those things, though, that a lot of us get into this by building these things, and and these days it's a little more complex. 
But uh, even then, you can still build an AM receiver that'll pick something up, and that's just really, really cool. Now, the challenges with AM, though, are, are pretty well known. Well, absolutely. Um, the, you know, the carrier doesn't uh, provide any data, and yet it uses 66% of the transmitter power. Um, and power consumption, you know, when you're running 50 kilowatts, is a, a big line item. As I mentioned there, uh, even with uh, your your uh, 50 kilowatt transmitters, what uh, how how many percent efficient, Jeff? So the, the 50 kilowatt, you're looking at about 88 percent overall AC to RF. But even so, there's still, like you said, if there's two thirds of the power not providing information, that's two thirds of the power that, except for lighting up the receiver, is essentially being wasted. Well, and on top of that, if you're in an environment where you're air conditioning, you've got to air condition that out of the building. And, uh, you know, where were we? Oh, Shreveport, K-E-E-L. You know, that building in Shreveport mm -hmm. had 15 tons of air conditioning. Yep. So, that stuff's not cheap. Oh, Eric's uh, in the, the comments mentions that AM was before CW. The Alex Anderson alternators used AM for both MCW and experiments in speech transmission before uh, CW with interrupted carrier was used. So there you go, history nice. lesson. And you know what, Eric, I may uh, bring you back for a session. Uh, we're booked up for a little while, but I think that uh, we could have a little session about the history of AM. We did something similar on the 100th anniversary, uh, I forget when, earlier this year, I think. Oh, yeah, 2021. So holy smokes, 100 years of AM. Anyway. I'm going to get sidetracked and that'll be the end of it. So uh, let's get back on topic. So MDCL. Well, modulation dependent carrier level. Um, there are a couple of different ways to do it, which by the way, Jeff, I've stole from uh, a Nautel white paper on MDCL, which I put into my uh, RCA paper, which you stole back to use for another <laughs> Nautel uh, project here. And uh, just to show you the whole circle of presentations, you know, that it's yeah. not the circle of life, it's a circle of presentation. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, for, for those who are, aren't uh, up, up to speed on MDCL, there's a couple of different ways to do it. There's a DA, DAM, uh, which is kind of the inverse way of thinking about it. It uh, reduces the carrier level when the audio is low. And there's AMC, which maintains the carrier at maximum when no audio is present and reduces yeah. the carrier and the modulation together by up to 6 dB when modulation is at maximum. Um, right. Both of these uh, methods were started a while back. B the BBC did most of the heavy lifting on this with testing back in the 80s. Uh, they were starting to... Uh, get concerned about how much energy they were using. Uh, and those transmitters weren't particularly easy to implement this with. So a lot of them were still tube-based. Uh, the fact that the BBC actually figured out a way to get it to work uh, is very interesting. Well, um, and but, you can uh, go back further in the history than that. Uh, I'm going to guess Brown Bovary and probably be wrong. But uh, there were uh, ham operators using variants of MDCL going back almost 60, 70 years. Um, obviously at a much lower power level, but uh, a similar concept. Um, for those, uh, just uh, if, if you're a regular attendee, you remember week, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, we had William Harrison on and William was, uh, gave us a, a big long list of uh, gift ideas for the broadcast engineer. Well, he's uh, just posted in the comments on Amazon a one of those uh, 50 and one electronic kits. So Ed, if you could uh, throw that up in the chat or make it public so everybody can see it. Anybody who's got kids and wants to uh, get them stuck into this same old thing, home electronics kit, I'm here to tell you, it uh, it got me here. But, uh, but yeah, the uh, MDCL, like you say, it's been only fairly recently that uh, we've been doing it on the, uh, on, on the broadcast side, on, on especially stateside, like in the U.S., uh, you know, uh, I know Alaska, Chuck Lakatis was uh, a big part of getting it going in Alaska early on. Well, I think that was right around, what, 2010, somewhere in that right. range. 2009, 2010, in that range. Yep, exactly. And, and those uh, guys went on the air and, uh, doing that with STA. So that, yeah. that wasn't even officially uh, frocked by the FCC in those days. Right, um, exactly. 
Do you want to, you want me to take this page? I, I stole it from you, Jeff. You, <laughs> it's. Uh, I mean, basically, it is talking about the, uh, the the different modulation and DAM is dynamic amplitude modulation, if I remember right. Um, I, I'll be the first to tell you, acronyms and me don't play well together. Uh, I've just gotten to the point where I remember what LOL is, but. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, having said that, um, the the difference between DAM and uh, AMC, amplitude modulation companding, is when they reduce the carrier. So yeah, go ahead, Mike. Well, so the, the, well, I think you pretty much covered it there, Jeff. Uh, but uh, the, the interesting part about uh, DAM is that uh, um, you can end up with some weird artifacts. Uh, the received loudness is increased when the carrier is reduced, and that's kind of uh, just the opposite way that we think of uh, AM working, uh, which, I, and there are some other issues. You've got to ramp up the uh, carrier level uh, quickly to, uh, as the modulation increases, or you end up with uh, distortion. So it, it's a little bit uh, uh, counterintuitive and hadn't really gotten a lot of uh, uptake, at least uh, nobody that I'm aware of is running it in the US. Yeah. Uh, which kind of leads us to AMC, which I believe is probably going to be the next slide, although I haven't seen yeah. it. Well, I, I did put the gain curve in, so just kind of lock that into your cortex, and then we'll uh, flip over to the a AMC description, and then you'll see the AMC gain curve. But but as you can see, as the uh, carrier power goes up, or the, the modulation goes up, the carrier power goes up. By the same token, as they go down, it goes down. And uh, so, like you say, yeah, on most receivers, that will lead to increased noise and would tend to have a greater effect on coverage area as well. Okay. So uh, with AMC carrier modulation together, decreased with increased audio modulation, um, the carrier is increased to full power during quiet periods when noise is most easily perceived, we hope. And uh, uh, as Modulation density is substantially increased with modern audio processing. AMC can generate greater efficiency. So, you know, the as we all know, the noise floor uh, in the AM band has uh, gone up dramatically over the last 20 or 30 years, probably in the range of 20 to 30 dB with all the junk that's uh, being generated by switching power supplies and LEDs and right. uh, You've got to run a lot of modulation density in this day and age just to try to get you up over the noise floor. And yeah. uh, and typically, we'd sure like to see you do that with uh, reduced uh, audio bandwidth. Uh, we we spend a fair amount of time in the uh, in Detroit, and I can tell you there isn't a car that's being shipped that has greater than three and a half kilohertz uh, audio bandwidth in the AM band. So, you know, if you're running NRSC nine kilohertz, it's uh, uh, it, it's kind of a waste, uh, and you'd probably be better served by running a lower audio bandwidth and, and putting as much energy into the receiver as you possibly can. Yeah, and, and that's one note to take. Now, the other thing to remember, and, and you uh, mentioned this, that uh, both the carrier and the modulation are decreased. And what you got to remember with AM is that the the modulation is relative to the carrier so say i've got a nominal carrier level of two i'm just going to call it two so in that case my modulation at 100 percent will go from zero to four but if i reduce my carrier to one then i've got to reduce my modulation from zero to two to maintain that 100 percent so th th that's what you're talking about it's still 100 percent mod it's just it's going to be a lower level of audio to achieve it because you've got a lower carrier all right, and so gain figure here, as we said before, turn the uh, as the uh, carrier or the mod depth goes up, the uh, carrier can go down, because again we've got the uh, I got that right, I got that backwards. Um, now I got it right. So uh, it definitely it's um, it is a little different. the The big thing is though, as your mod depth goes down, your carrier goes up, so your signal to noise level doesn't get the hit that you would get with a DAM system. And especially for North America, where you've got an AM and you're covering a, a huge geographic area, especially you get out into flyover country where it's fairly flat and a lot of land and 
I see uh, Chris Alexander is in the audience from uh, Colorado, so the good example. Then uh, you don't want to mess with your fringe coverage any more than you can. And uh, so that's uh, that's one of the benefits to AMC over, over DAM. And I know, Mike, you've done a lot of uh, experimenting with the different kinds and uh, different injection levels as well. Well, and you were part of that uh, testing we did with uh, uh, Town Square in Boise, Idaho. There may um, be pictures. Oh, oh no, I hope not. <laughs> and we, you know, we we decided that it would be real interesting. We being uh, um, Nautel, uh, Orban, and uh, Town Square uh, to run some testing at uh, greater than three dB AMC to see what the impact was on fringe coverage. And uh, we went out and did uh, field strength measurements and audio recording, and uh, we were 60 miles away from the transmitter site. Uh, to get to the uh, uh, half microvolt, uh, not microvolt, millivolt uh, yeah. per meter uh, contour, and actually ended up having to run the transmitter power down because even at 60 miles out, we were still over that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we did a whole series of tests at 3 dB, 4 dB, 5 dB, and 6 dB AMC uh, at... Um, 125% positive, and we had an SDA to run 150% positive uh, during that testing and to do enhanced MDCL, which uh, added 1.76 dB of uh, additional power. Um, we did run into some concerns about how much uh, the phaser could take and how much the tuners could take and ended up uh, reducing the transmitter power down to the point where we uh, didn't let the factory smoke out of anything. Um, and that was a very interesting set of tests. And at, at the end of the yeah. day, um, you know, you, you could run greater than 3 dB AMC and you could do it with uh, a marginal impact, a small amount of impact to your fringe coverage. And I think the proof uh, kind of was in the pudding that uh, uh, Town Square um, is running 6 dB AMC on uh, all their stations that are capable of doing it, and uh, they've lived to tell about it. And mm -hmm. they've done it and had zero complaints. So uh, what they've saved in, in power is substantial. Uh, and that's, uh, of course, uh, interesting. You got some pictures to back any of that up, Mr. Uh, well, I, I do coming up. Yep, we'll, we'll hit on those as well. Um, because yeah, I mean, I can uh, we can talk about the theory all day long, but when you get right down to it, the power bill is where it matters, and uh, and so yeah, we'll talk about that uh, to configure this. So the funny thing, and I say funny, uh, funny peculiar, um, these days where everything is a computer, um, the difference between DCC and HD radio is surprisingly little insofar as the hardware required. So, you know, if you've got an AM IBOC unit, for example, um, our DCC unit is the same hardware. Uh, and, and that's uh, just something to, uh, to keep in the back of your mind. On our new, speaking for us, the newer gear, the NX series, the uh, MDCL is built right into the Exciter. So you just go in through the user interface and select your algorithm, which uh, when we were working with the NX in Boise made it a lot easier because you guys could call me from the field and say, go here, go there, and I just switch a preset and we were here or there. Um, you know, so that uh, that was pretty cool. Now, uh, Marco Check has got a question. Uh, if you start to um, use MDCL, you do have to uh, let the FCC know, correct? It, but now it's just a notification letter, is that right? So, to the best of my knowledge, it's a notification letter. There's no STA uh, required. Uh, let's say I see uh, Chris Alexander's in the audience and uh, a few other U.S. broadcasters who I know run an MDCL. So if, if I'm wrong on that, by all means, throw a note into the questions or, or hit your hand wave and, and uh, let, let's uh, elucidate on that. But yeah, I, I believe it is just a notification letter to let them know that you are doing it. Um, so that's uh, that's useful. Now, this is some of the uh, readings that we took, just to give an idea of the savings. And uh, Mike, you want to talk to those a little? Sure, uh, you'll have to, uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So this is 60 miles out from the transmitter site. And Jeff, do you remember, we ended up running the transmitter down to what, I think three kilowatts or something? I, I, uh, 
At the lowest, I believe I had it sitting just shy of two. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. That, and, and that, uh, was, that was because we didn't want to have to drive to Wyoming to uh, uh, get to the uh, half. Uh, so we didn't want to have to drive to Wyoming to do that. And we didn't want to have to drive to uh, to Memphis in the other direction to get parts <laughs> if I happened to get a little carried away. Because at one point, we were, when we were running EAMC, we were putting back uh, almost 2 dB of uh, power with the EAMC. So, uh, yeah, so we've compensated for that on the front end just to make sure that we weren't going to, uh, yeah, let the magic smoke out. Well, I think that we weren't concerned about the transmitter. We were more concerned about the phaser and the tuners. Um, I'm the transmitter guy. I'm always concerned about the transmitter. It's, you know, it, it looks bad if I blow it up while I'm standing in front of it. I usually try to wait till I'm 50 miles away. Well, I, I, I'd say something about the fact that I've never blown up an Autel, and I've had a couple of dozen of them over the years that uh, uh, intrinsically reliable seems to be the, the hallmark for those things. But, well, I appreciate um, it. Well, but yeah, I mean, you can get an idea from here, just the, the right hand column, as you look uh, four columns in talks about the uh, the level of MDCL, the, the, the compression level we were using, and uh, the impact it had. And you can see that the, uh, the decibels and the uh, reduction in consumption track pretty closely. Well, and, and, oh, you know, go ahead. Marco, Marco caught me. He, rem he remembers that I blew up his XL60. Uh, and I did. I blew it up big. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's in, uh, he features in one of my uh, sessions on uh, why you shouldn't work when you're overtired. And, uh, yeah, that was an expensive lesson. Well, it, it, better you than me, Jeff. That's all I want to say with that. Um, well, and, and, yeah, to cut to the got to the chase here, uh, the reduction in, in power consumption is pretty dramatic. And especially if you can, uh, um, if you want to live at greater than 3 dB of uh, AMC, um, there's some serious uh, savings to be had there. And, and we have a bunch of uh, folks that are out there running 6 dB AMC right now. And they're uh, loving every minute of that 77% power. Uh, uh, yeah. Consumption now, reduction, and this this is something else to mention, and, and I'll I'll give a, a quick shout out, uh, and and I give a shout out to these folks because they're the ones that I see on Facebook the most uh, promoting it. But uh, Nick Strack and Daniel Hyatt over at DNAV do a lot of uh, Orban installs, and uh, they talk quite a bit about how the uh, higher audio density makes a difference. Well, look, you're going to end up running the station at eleven in terms of modulation density, okay? And that's a very subtle uh, spinal tap uh, uh, joke, but um, you, you've got, it, there's nothing free in this world. And so you've got to make up for the carrier reduction with modulation density. And if you're willing to do that, then the impact at, at your fringe coverage is, um, greatly minimized than if you're not running at 11. And uh, yeah, the uh, Nick and uh, Daniel are uh, guys who've got a lot of these under their belt and know how to set them up and get them to be that way. But, uh, and you need to run that modulation density anyways, just to get you up over the noise floor. I mean, all you gotta do is drive around Denver and listen to KOA uh, and pull up to a stoplight with LED lights in the stoplight and the hash coming out of those and KOA from downtown Denver is like 10 miles and it's 50 kilowatt non-directional. And, uh, you know, you've got to get the density up you to, to get over the noise floor problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, sorry, it's just not, there's no two ways about it. You got to yeah. turn it up. And if you're going to turn it up and you're going to run that modulation density, you may as well take the benefit of running greater than 3 dB of AMC. Right. It's not going to kill you. Yeah, and uh, let's see, flicking back up here a couple. Um, so uh, you touched on it briefly, but uh, just as an example, running uh, MDCL at uh, AMC with uh, minus 3 dB, the, the most uh, conservative uh, compression level, um, you've done lots and lots of uh, far field uh, into the uh, 
in, into the 50 dBU, et cetera, contours. Um, uh, what impact do you see on overall overall coverage area? Well, I think that's a good question, and a lot of that depends on on a bunch of things. Um, you know, the the question is who's out there, and how much of it do you need to cover, and how much density can you run uh, from a modulation standpoint? And at 3 dB, with enough modulation density, there's virtually zero impact at, at uh, fringe coverage. Uh, mm -hmm. When you get to 6 dB, you're going to notice it. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to sit here and blow a bunch of sunshine everybody up everybody's skirt and say that, you know, it's it's all perfect. There's It's all going to be great. Uh, there is an impact out there. Um, yeah. uh, you know, for example, we're, we uh, I spent three days out at KSL uh, AM, and they're running HD radio on AM, and we ended up at 5 dB AMC instead of 6. Mm -hmm. And that was just based on uh, solid HD uh, radio uh, decode and what happened out at the fringe. Yeah. But, uh, they, you know, that was still a huge savings in power reduction for them over running 3 dB, and they got zero complaints. KEEL mm -hmm. Shreveport's running 6. Yeah. Uh, that's the top uh, news talker in Shreveport, and they got zero complaints. Yeah, and, and uh, talking about uh, KSL with the HD, and so there's something else to be aware of, and the question hadn't been asked uh, at this point, but I know folks that are doing it, uh, you can run this with hybrid HD. With oh, absolutely. MA1. Now, in an all-digital world, it wouldn't make any difference because your carrier level is constant, so the MDCL would do nothing. But uh, in an actual AM situation, which hybrid AM is, AM plus HD, certainly it makes a difference. Um, Mark Persons brings up a really good question. Hey, Mark, um, uh, what does a field intensity reading look like under modulation conditions? And so the big thing to remember about this, somebody asked me to describe MDCL in, in the shortest sentence possible once and i looked at him and i said intentional carrier shift and <laughs> it, it's what it is so uh so your field intensity meter is going to jump around like crazy just like the power meter on the transmitters will correct pretty much yeah but remember we were using that uh, potomac instruments uh, pi 4100 uh, i think which... i've got a picture of that in here too yeah <laughs> which it, that is the most amazing piece of test equipment I've ever used. I mean, it literally, other than the only thing it didn't do was drive itself out to where we needed to go and set itself up and take the readings, but everything else it did was pretty much uh, automatic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, man, you know, if I could justify uh, buying one of those, that was a really nice piece of hardware. Yeah. But yeah. The, the short answer, Mark, is that if you do take your FIM out to do a monitor point, you are going to have to shut the MDCL off CL because off. the meter will jump all over the place. Um, let's see. Marco wants to know for um, so, yeah, the, the, in your experience for talk radio stations, the more critical to set up the MDL, MDCL. So talk versus music. Is there any difference or any challenges for, for setting up a talk format? I mean, density tends to be a little lower with, with speech over music, yeah? Well, it, well obviously, we, you know, the, how much density do we have going in the processor? If we have somebody talking, that's different than if we're running music. And we, shockingly, we still do have stations out there that are running MDCL with, uh, in, in uh, music formats, and I know a couple of them. Um, there are, you know, there, there are some things that, that uh, you, you certainly will need to do with the processing to optimize it for speech over music. Uh, again, I, I really want to uh, go back to limiting audio bandwidth, four and a half kilohertz, four kilohertz. Um, I, I sure wouldn't be running greater than that. Um, the number of receivers out there that can actually take that, uh, very few. Uh, C Crane makes a couple that have a selectable audio bandwidth out to about six kilohertz, and we've tested some of those, and they're very nice radios, but uh, a ma vast, vast majority of your listeners are going to be in vehicles, and there isn't a radio that uh, is being shipped that I'm aware of that has greater than a three and a half kilohertz uh, bandwidth in AM. So right. narrow up the bandwidth, run the density up, um, 
typically for talk. Uh, if you're talking about doing a, an XPN AM, uh, I usually start with the music uh, medium preset and then increase the less more control to about nine and a half or so. And then from there, you can kind of tweak around with it until you get right. to where you want. Um, at uh, WSB, we ended up at uh, three and a half kilohertz bandwidth, three and a half or four. I'd have to look at the preset. Uh, we were running nine and a half on the less more control. We made some changes to equalization and off to the race. Cool. Now, Elaine's modified her question. So what's the difference in coverage area with and without significant processing? And I guess that, that same deal as you crank up the uh, processing, the audio density, you are cranking up the uh, the MDCL algorithm and reducing the peak power. But again, relatively speaking, if you're running 3 dB, it's not going to be that big, is it? I, I don't think so. And, and our, you know, we don't, I don't think we've ever had anybody ever call back and say that uh, running MDCL resulted in them getting phone calls. Yeah, and uh, tying into that, uh, Brian Black asked, but how does it sound? Um, uh, we're, I realize we're talking AM, but the sound is still important and that's accurate enough. I mean, really the goal of this, the algorithms have the attacks and releases set and uh, Tales out of school, uh, I don't know, I don't see John White's name in the audience list, but I'm sure my phone will start ringing any second now. Uh, that algorithm is constantly being tweaked and uh, we do play with different uh, attack and release times and there may or may not be a release coming out shortly that we hope will improve it even more. Uh, but the goal is to minimize, uh, our, basically we try not to impact the audio. Now having said that, if you're trying to improve the power savings by cranking up the density and you're up to half a, di a dB of dynamic range, it's going to sound like hammered crap in a tin can. Well, uh, Jeff, let, let me qualify that just a little here, here bit. Here comes the process again. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, we can, look, you, you can get aggressive and you can do that without making your ears fall off. And, um, you know, the, the, the current uh, state-of-the-art processor uh, that we're shipping today is uh, very different than the one that we were shipping five years ago. And, you know, sure. Bob's done a whole pile of work on AM processing. And, um, you know, we have customers that are very aggressively processed and their TSL numbers aren't falling off the page. And mm -hmm. you know, we could we could sit here and yap about audio quality all, all we want, but it's really, uh, if you're looking at time spent listening, if you're not impacting your TSL, then your processing is doing a good job for you. And if you can process it with a lot of density and you can drive um, the carrier down longer and harder, you're gonna save more money. And if you can do that without impacting your TSL, you've won. Yes, yeah. and, we and, and it comes back to the age old like everything else. I mean, somebody got talking about uh, about um, saving money on, on their FM with uh, something like this. And I said, yeah, you could do that or you could just turn the uh, power down by 3 dB and uh, do the same thing with minimal impact on anything. So yeah, there definitely it's, uh, there have been a lot of improvements. Um, and uh, I remember many, many years ago, more than five by a long shot, I was uh, standing at the top of a very tall building in a city on the eastern seaboard of where you're sitting right now. And uh, while I was standing up there, the monitor was going and a local guy went out and he comes back. He goes, how long have we been off? I said, you're not off the air. He goes, the monitors are quiet. And I said, I turned them off. They were making my ears hurt. Um, but but yeah, again, a lot of it is situational too. Some markets that's normal, others not so much. Um, you, uh, so Gary Cavell says that his understanding is that the FCC requires you to turn the system off for doing field strength measurements. And I, I know Gary knows more about this stuff than I do, so I'm gonna take him at his word. But folks, you heard it here first. If you get yelled at, Gary Cavell, Cavell and Mertz. Um, hey, uh, uh, we'll post his phone number a little later. <laughs> Elaine wants to know how many AMs are running MDCL right now. Do you have any idea on that? I know for our uh, NX customers, it's a sizable portion because again, it's included. They just turn it on. Well, I've done, 
during the early days of uh, our, our new AM uh, processor, I installed all of those. And so it, there are at least 20 plus uh, transmitters out there running MDCL. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I've personally done. So. Yeah. And I know just like I said, from the customers that I know have just turned it on and uh, filed the notification, I'm aware of triple digits worth of our customers at least. Well, Gary, um, Gary could look that up for us. He could. There you go, Gary. You've got a challenge. But we don't want to tear him away from the webinar too much either. Um, John Van Milligan's asking, does it work with AM stereo? And there's no real reason why it wouldn't work with AM stereo. He, he makes the comment that's pretty rare these days, but having said that, any NX transmitter also has AM stereo built into it. So yeah, it's just a matter of turning the pilot on. Well, and, and, the, uh, and the processor will do stereo. Yeah, so uh, that's right, because you guys are using the XPN for all of these uh, tests, yeah? The, isn't that the, I got the model number right, yay. yay. I can barely yes. remember my own truck products someday. So if I can think of yours, that's that tells you you made an impact. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, AM stereo, the only non, AM stereo and AM IBOC are practically identical insofar as you've got both a phase modulated component and then amplitude modulated. And the amplitude modulated is what triggers the MDCL algorithm. So as long as that's there, that's why I said earlier that it won't work with all digital with MA3 AM, because in that you have no amplitude modulated component. It's 100% phase modulated with the digital carriers, which is really kind of weird when you think about it, because now AM is FM, but not. Um, now I got you th there. See, now there's your head scratcher for the day. Um, William makes the comment that my Sony SRF A100 sure sounded good, but I'm the only person in a five county area with a decent AM radio. So the processors, yep, yeah, set to a six kilohertz bandwidth. Uh, and again, like you say, wasting energy in the stuff nobody can receive. Uh, okay, Marco has got a comment here. Marco, do you have a microphone? Uh, throw me a yes or no in the questions if you do, because uh, I want to ask you questions and you do have a slide coming up. I took the information you sent me and uh, I'd like to uh, bring that in. But he mentions that, let me flick back here. When I turned on MDCL on my transmitter in Calgary, I drove back to Edmonton about 350 kilometers, which is roughly 200 miles for the non-metric speaking people, and didn't notice any changes in the audio until he was close to Edmonton, which is, of course, where the signal, the noise, well, the traffic lights and uh, all that other stuff uh, sort of um, starts to uh, factor in. Um, Steve Schmidt tells me that KICY in Nome, Alaska is running it. And yes, we knew about that. I think uh, KICY featured in one of our social media. They've got an NX50 and an NX10 up there. I think and, they have uh, an XPN AM in there. And they've got uh, power rates that uh, would make the average of us blush. So Marco does have a microphone and let me see. Uh, Marco, I'm gonna unmute you in a little bit because I wanna, when we hit the slide on the power savings that you sent me. So um, so the higher modulation density does make a difference. And uh, you've done tests and we talked about this uh, and we did quite a bit on it in Boise about uh, the different um, compression levels, three, four, five, and six dB. Well, yes, and we somewhat touched on this before, but uh, it's certainly worth, if you have a transmitter capable of doing it, and you're running 3 dB AMC right now, you know, I certainly would uh, suggest that next time you're at the transmitter site, you know, increasing the AMC level to 4 dB or 5 dB or 6 dB and just see what happens. Um, it, it's certainly worth a shot. And the, the power savings are a bottom line uh, line item. Yeah, and the, the big thing to remember for that is that uh, you know if you're trying to rim shot a town and you're barely getting there to begin with you're not going to want to crank it up to six no but and if you're in an area where you are the biggest thing in town and there's nothing but cows and cornfields at the uh, you know the 50 dbu contour then this may be a very viable option well and you know, we've got customers that are looking to absolutely uh, 
Uh, we have a customer in Euphreda, Washington, that's trying to get into Spokane, and that's 100 miles away, uh, 810. And, you know, they're paying three cents a kilowatt hour for power. So for them, running AMC was not anything that made any sense. They were looking for how do we get solid coverage in downtown Spokane? And the answer was run the modulation density up and let's not run yeah. AMC at all. That three, right. three cents a kilowatt hour it was a no brainer. Yep. And I mean, obviously, this is going to be a judgment call that uh, ties in. I've got some pictures of some various places that you and I have played in over the last little while coming up. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. So uh, I think I saw Tim in the audience as well, but <laughs> not not sure he expected to be featured today. That's uh, Brian and Tim from BSW there, isn't it? Yes, it is with the uh, Potomac Instruments uh, PI-41. 100 that we rented from uh, Potomac to do that testing. And uh, on that right image is a, a C-Crane uh, Skywave radio uh, running into a Tascam uh, recorder. And yeah. this, the Skywave had a six kilohertz bandwidth capability. So uh, that allowed us to, to take a listen to what was really going on there. Yeah. And uh, so my run and joke when uh, people ask me how complicated our, our transmitters are, I said, look, I said, I, I put one in the other day. They're so simple. A sales guy can install them. And uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the shout out for that Potomac so simple that a sales guy can operate it. But, well, which uh, is pretty much true. Uh, there were three sales guys operating the uh, Potomac. Just kidding. Uh, yeah. But, now, having yeah. said that, all the sales guys had more than a little bit of technical background too. Oh, but well, yeah, I, I yeah, I, it it made a good joke. But uh, seriously, you know, we 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 do know which end of the soldering iron gets hot. That would explain the scar. <laughs> <laughs> Does not smell like chicken. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, one of the other things that you can do if you're not sure what you're looking at for potential savings. Uh, we do have a calculator on our website. I did throw the link at the bottom of the slide. Um, I've, I've said this before, I'll say it again, but we do archive all this stuff. So if you do miss writing it down, you can always come back and catch it later. But uh, this is one of the more moderate comparisons that you can expect to see. And we'll we'll let you compare to existing transmitter with whatever your current efficiency is versus uh, one of our NX boxes, and then with MDCL added in. So uh, anyway, that's uh, something you can find on the website. Of course, I'm sure somebody somewhere tracks this stuff with cookies or whatever, and uh, they send me a report, and I dutifully ignore it. So uh, no phone calls will result as a consequence of using this slide. Um, now. I am going to unmute Marco and let him talk a little bit about this because this is real life uh, experiences, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, uh, with a, uh, a couple of our boxes. So Marco, you'll have to hit your mute button there. And I see you're still red. There you Hello. go, you're green now. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Am I coming through? Yep. You are loud and clear. So um, this is uh, this is actual power savings that you guys are seeing. Uh, this is actual uh, bills uh, that we got from our power company that I actually wrote down the power consumption uh, that they were charging us from the previous year to the year when I turn on MDCL. And I mean, these, these numbers, like looking at these savings, you're looking at uh, $10,000 over the year at six cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah, and um, this actually was the reason that we were, I was allowed to get the field mod for the XL60 you blew up. <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to let me forget that, are you? I am not. <laughs> but it's still running. It's running uh, uh, very well. So. Well, it should. It was rebuilt on site pretty much from scratch. <laughs> so... Uh, I'll tell the story because I, I get to the site and of course, typical field service guy, and, and I was much, much younger and a whole lot dumber then. Um, and that's saying something. But uh, I get to the site, I've been traveling probably the better part of nine or 10 hours by the time Marco picks me up the airport. We go out to the site, we go through all the commissioning, all the install, we get everything running. 
And so it's, you know, pushing midnight, one o'clock Alberta time. So that's two or three in the morning, Halifax time. I've been awake for 20 something hours at this point. And I've got more coffee in me than any one person should have. I'm vibrating. And I said, okay, let's do some training. And I'm explaining the exciters. And I said, so if the exciter fails, it'll switch to the other one. I pull out the crystal in the oscillator and it goes down three seconds later, switches to the other exciter, comes right back up. And I said, but it's one way, one time. So you've got to go fix it. And if so, if the other exciter fails before you get the first one fixed, you're dead. And I pull the, ex the crystal out of that one, it goes down. And so I'm talking, talking about this. And I said, so, uh, you know, but uh, to get it back on air, all you really need to do is select one of the exciters after you fixed it. So I select an exciter and then I realize I hadn't plugged the crystal back in. So as the transmitter's trying to come up, I reach up and plug the crystal in. Well, I don't know what frequency a crystal comes up on initially, but I can guarantee you it's not the carrier frequency. And the transmitter made this squeal like a, uh, my my equivalent was sort of like a hamster going through a bandsaw. And, uh, and we immediately lit up the uh, PA fail on a whole bunch of power amplifiers. And I looked over, smiled sweetly and said, and this is where we get to practice troubleshooting. So what what should have been a long day turned into an even longer day, as as I recall. But I, I'm glad uh, Marco can still. Uh, well, no, 20 odd years later, Marco can tell a joke about it. I don't know how much we were joking then. Well, just so, to clarify, though, that was Ray who you were with when he was installed, not me. I just oh, so her. you inherited the mess. That's it. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so yeah, that, that that was what 20 20 something years ago now, 24, yeah. 25. Uh, I, the transfer, I think, was put in about 2001, 2000, around there. And so you've got the note here that on the XL60, of course, you did have to buy the field mod kit because, as I said, the uh, the XL60, the older products, uh, you've got to basically almost do an HD radio upgrade and install a separate outboard DCC unit, whereas on the NX series, it's built right in and you just go into a preset and turn it on. And uh, so at 11 grand to do the upgrade, it paid for itself reasonably quickly then. Yep, made the boss happy. Well, bosses tend to be happy when the power bill goes down. Well, thank you very much for that, Marco. And uh, that's so quick shout out for Marco. I don't think you've missed more than one or two of these TTT sessions since we started doing them a year and a half ago. Uh, maybe about half a dozen or so. So thanks very much for that too. And Marco's also pretty honest about calling me out if I uh, slack off and he doesn't think I'm uh, up to my usual standards. So I appreciate that as well. Yeah. No problem. All right, thank you, Marco. So on that note, uh, let's move forward a notch here. And this is a um, big old, uh, this is part of the spreadsheet that I built when we were in Boise. Oh, very good. Now, of course, so, it means I have to actually remember what it was it. because yeah. this goes back a long way. Remember, well, they had that really cool power analyzer. Oh, yeah, yeah, that three-phase monster that we hooked up to the transmitter, yes. Yep. Oh. And I don't remember exactly what all it measured, but, I mean, it looked at everything. And I think what we're looking at here, I'm seeing latitude, longitude, and elevation. So I think this is part of the data dump from the Potomac. Yep, because that thing recorded again everything. Yeah, no, it. Uh, yes, you can see the time, lat launch, whether or not a valid GPS. Like I said, it literally. Uh, the only thing it didn't do was drive the car out there and set yeah. itself up. But uh, yeah, there you go. Well, it's the cool thing about it is that we're able to get the uh, instantaneous field strength as you can tell like if you look down on line 21 it's showing 118 db microvolts per meter compared to an average of about 60. so it uh, it does show you the peaks too and, and that's pretty cool but uh, we took massive amounts of data this was the uh, power analyzer we were looking at uh, volts and current uh, peak and rms as well as uh, power consumption and output power for uh, all three phases, uh, we even included the KVAR, the reactive power. Oh, I see we uh, went down a tenth of a hertz at one point, but uh, but yeah, I mean, there was, uh, I had a grand total in that particular um, 
that particular file, the, the recordings, we had over 4,000 line entries per uh, per sequence because we were setting, the, do you remember, Mike, we were like 10 or 15 minutes at one uh, injection level? Yes, and uh, the recorder was doing uh, every four seconds. So the power was being uh, recorded every four seconds. Yeah, and uh, the theory there was that if we did it over a long enough period of time, we'd get a, a reliable average accounting for modulation. Uh, Correct. And overall, as I recall, I mean, like you said before, the difference between uh, 3dB and 6dB was noticeable, but uh, the difference between off and 3dB was huge. <laughs> well, that, yes. And, and uh, you know, how far out were we? We were so far out that we parked by the side of the road and didn't see another car for the six hours that we were out there doing that testing. So that testing wasn't just set up and take a quick uh, measurement and disappear. We were out there for six hours. And now, uh, I, I want to say uh, one of the pictures that you had meant or made a notation that uh, you were out there long enough that at one point one of the county mounties came by to see exactly what you were doing. Yeah, they, they were like, hey, what? I didn't count those in as as, uh, as real vehicles. You know, when the police show up, that's a whole different deal. So, but yeah. uh, you, you work in AM long enough, sooner or later, you're going to be at a site or at a monitor point and uh, the police are going to show up. It's I'm not sure whether that says that we're unsavory characters or whether it uh, just sort of uh, shows well, the, that uh, we spend a lot of time in one place. Well, the, uh, the the quick side uh, joke was that uh, uh, Town Square brought uh, two of their FIM 41s, and uh, we ran out to, uh, I don't know, it was a mile or two away from the site, transmitter site, uh, on some side street in a subdivision, and we got their FM, uh, FIM 41s out, and we compared them to the PI 4100. So we had all these guys running around with all these weird boxes and we're just double checking that their stuff matched uh, the, the latest and greatest, which by the way, they did within a very small uh, margin of error. And as we packed up and started driving away, the police showed up so that somebody in the neighborhood called the cops on us, which I thought was pretty funny, so. Yeah, so one of the things you'll notice here and uh, I do tend to be kind of, uh, I'm not concise. Anybody who's ever read any of my emails or had a conversation with me at all knows that. And if you look at the preset name in the title block here, um, I know we're running enhanced AMC. We've got 5 dB of compression and 1.3 kilowatts was our set point for power, for what it's worth. Um, I don't remember why we backed it down that far. And I, I do think that, like you say, we were... Uh, we're wandering into uncharted territory and we sure didn't want to blow anything up at a site that we didn't own 100%. Well, and, you know, discretion is always the better part of valor. And the last thing we wanted to do is let a lot of factory smoke out of something and put them off the air. And they were, the town square folks were nice enough. And that's where yeah. the capital N to allow us to come out to their station in Boise and uh, uh, do all this testing and, and run all these tests and and they were magnanimous about it so yeah. uh, we want to certainly be uh, uh we didn't want to be those guys the the guests that uh, just yeah. uh wreck up the house and then won't leave yep yeah. <laughs> so the thing to see though and one of the things you can tell is when the compression kicks in you can see that for example the uh, power reading is showing uh, 640 watts with a 1.3 kilowatt set point so it, it's down roughly 3 db right there and i think somewhere i sent you a, a bad picture of ksl uh running a 50 kilowatt uh, 48 kilowatt set point uh, with a forward power of about 12. yeah and uh, and that's what we were coming back to uh, responding to Mark Person's question earlier. Uh, you will not be taking power readings or field intensity readings with MDCL turned on. And so that is an important thing to remember. Um, you know, uh, definitely, and, and I mean, this nothing new. It used to be way back in the old days, you were supposed to shut your audio off when you took your uh, base current readings. I don't know if that's still the case or not. I think. Uh, 
the rules are a little more um, just prove you're legal. However you happen to do that is totally up to you. But, uh, but by the same token, on AM, where we're purposely varying the power level, in order to get accurate power level readings, you have to stop that variation. Uh-oh, Mike's thinking. No, no, this, this is... I was just looking at the positive modulation, which was running 137 uh, percent. Yeah, well, we were... did say we did have the STA for 150, 150. at the time. Yeah, I we was did just... do some measurements with that, and I think that was one of those ones. We did that, and then we kind of realized that between 150 and 125, there was less difference. And, and I think that that's where your studies, if I'm not mistaken, proved later on that the density made more difference than the actual peak, because well, how long it's up there versus how far it goes. Well, it, it, and the other thing, Jeff, was, you know, in retrospect, when we looked at it, um, you know, we really didn't think that the FCC would be inclined to uh, let a bunch of AM broadcasters run 150% uh, positive modulation with a 1.76 uh, uh, carrier bump. We just didn't think they'd have the appetite for it. And that, that uh, in terms of power handling for phasers and tuners and everything else, um, you know, it, it didn't look like it was going to be very practical. And, and we thought we'd get a lot more benefit for broadcasters to run uh, higher levels of AMC at their authorized power, uh, running 125% positive modulation, which is all within their the, uh, their license right. uh, capability today, that that would be more beneficial than, than trying to uh, run through a bunch of flaming hoops and, and do stuff that requires wild STAs and a lot of FCC time. Right. Well, and because anytime you increase power, of course, you're impacting all of your co-channels and, uh, you know, depending on your frequencies, that uh, that can be a big situation. If you're on a clear, that's a problem. Now, um, a good quick time check note, we're running on the top of the hour, uh, except for I think last week was the only one I've ever finished early ever. Um, I don't think we're going to finish early today. We've got a couple more minutes because there's a few other questions I want to hit. So uh, I will let folks know this will be archived. But yeah, if you can hang around for another five or 10 minutes, that'd be cool. Um, so I had a question earlier, and I'm not sure if you've done the math on this or not. But somebody asked in the advanced questions, at what point does this become beneficial? And, uh, you know, five kilowatts, one kilowatt, three kilowatts, 10 kilowatts, where do you see? And, and I think the answer is it depends. Well, we, the first site that we ever put on the air with XPN was running 10, uh, an hotel 10 kilowatt at uh, KSEN in Shelby, Montana which is like 20 miles from the Canadian border in the middle of a giant wheat field. And uh, you would think that at 10 kilowatts, there wouldn't be a sizable savings. And the feedback I got back from the uh, engineer was that the GM got power bills and was looking at it going, wow, this made a big difference. And that's at 10 kilowatts. So mm -hmm. I, I believe you're, you know, if you're at five kilowatts and you're paying 45 cents a kilowatt hour, yeah, it's probably going to be worth your while. Yeah. Uh, you know, now, it, go ahead. And the, the caveat, too, again, if you've got one of our NX series transmitters, even an NX3, the, the three kilowatt, this is already built in, so it doesn't cost you anything to turn it on. Um, and, you know, you turn it on or set the preset, flick it in, and then do a drive test. And, and that's the key thing. You've got to do the drive test because you want to be sure that you're not going to impact coverage on the fringes. And I mean, at lower power levels, of course, 3 dB of uh, 3 kilowatts drops you down to one and a half. Well, that that's, you know, it, 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 I think the square law is going to have a little more impact. So you definitely want to pay attention to that. But, uh, you know, did, did that sound accurate to you, Mike? Yeah, and, and again, the other thing is that, you know, if you're lightly processing, um, you're going to take a bigger beating at the fringe than if you've got it turned up to 11. So, yeah. uh, and we'll leave it at that. 
Yeah, and that's absolutely, you know, and I made the joke about uh, half DB before, but uh, there, there's a wide range of, uh, you know, of uh, processing density between half a DB and uh, minus 40. So uh, absolutely, you know, cranking up the, and I picked 40 DB because uh, a, a zillion years ago, plus a day, I was in the same city you're in, and there is a large, uh, classical uh, station that we just uh, set up an HD transmitter for. And I was going uh, down I-94 in my rental car and all of a sudden it got really quiet. And I said, oh no, they're off the air, the audio's gone. Not my transmitter, I don't hear static, but I crank it up and I crank it up and I hear this very, very faint, like a flute solo. And then all of a sudden this cannon serenade comes in and just about lifted me across two lanes of traffic. Um, because it, it turns out that, that they were running a huge amount of dynamic range. And, and yeah, it just hit this little quiet passage. So uh, absolutely, you know, you can run more density than that. And uh, certainly, depending on your market and your format and your overall processing, like, like Mike said, I mean, the, uh, the TSL is, is the critical part. You know, if people aren't tuning away, you're doing it right. That's kind of the bottom line. Now, Elaine brings a good comment here, and, and this is a good point. I wonder if you've tested this. Uh, Elaine, I'm going to have to put her on payroll pretty soon uh, because she's feeding me questions better than uh, anybody. But uh, in areas with tiered power rates that have like peak periods of the day and low periods, I, I mean, for here, for example, the rate overnight is lower than the rate during the day. Um, could you set up time of day changes? And the short answer is with an NX transmitter, you absolutely can because you select the preset and you in each preset, you program which algorithm or no algorithm and the density. Now, what about uh, time parting the density of the processing? Can you Could you day part the XPN? Absolutely. So again, you could, uh, or you could theoretically, I guess, even if you have one that can't be day part, day parted, you could uh, clone a preset and then tweak the density in each preset and then select the preset with the transmitter with a contact closure. Yeah, the, the uh, that, that would be the hard way to do it. But you could certainly get it done. And with XPN, you could just feed it an AUI call by IP and off you went. You could get the remote to uh, uh, feed it. So when the remote's telling the transmitter to go to X or Y or in critical hours or whatever, you just, here, pull this preset and run it. Yeah, so that is uh, that is cool. And I mean, it's one of those things, you know, when you think back over the years, you know, day parting was something that was fairly common years ago. And then we kind of, I guess, mostly got away from it as we sort of standardized formats, but uh, it's uh, it could definitely have a benefit. I hesitated over showing this picture because it's, uh, I, I looked at this and I looked at Mike when we first started talking. I said, man, were you using a fisheye lens or a wide angle lens on this? Um, so now you know why I've lost 40 odd pounds since January because quitting smoking did a number on my waistline. But uh, so this was, uh, yeah, we've got uh, old, in the, old in the left and I'm looking at what looks like a, uh, is that a Collins in the back behind Brian? Oh yeah, uh, Rockwell. Yeah, I, so uh, yeah, kind of cool. But uh, but that was the site we spent a lot of days in. Yeah, and and we lived to tell about it. I don't know if the Rockwell was uh, capable of being run or not, and or if it was just kind of occupying floor space. I think those are uh, mm -hmm. moving blankets that were sitting on the top of the one on the right. So yeah, I, I don't recall if that was capable of being run or not. Yeah, Williams made a uh, note that I need to use learn how to use Photoshop. I could shave those pounds right off. But uh, yeah, I think a good combination of diet and exercise probably helped me out a little more in that regard. All right, we're getting off of that picture. So on that note, this webinar, as with all of our webinars, will be archived for posterity, that picture included. Great. See, I don't think these things through carefully enough when I'm building the slide decks. Uh, but you can find it on our website through resources and webinars. You can go to our YouTube channel where the uh, the TTT sessions are actually broken out in their own playlist, I believe. If they're not, then I'm sure that Ed will frantically be uh, 
doing so as we speak. Um, a shout out, by the way, to Mr. Disembodied Voice, Ed Sylvester, who's in the background making everything work and sending me snide little remarks in the personal chat to uh, make sure I stay on track. Uh, uh, thanks, Jeff. And uh, there is a dedicated playlist for these in the YouTube. There you go. See, I, I knew Ed would know the answer to that. Um, by all means, check out the Waves newsletter and uh, online resources, Barry Mishkin's broadcaster's desktop resource. Uh, uh, I think Chris Tarr has a lot to do with the uh, broadcastengineering.info website. I like that one. I don't check any of them nearly as much as I should, but uh, that's there, radiolists.net. Facebook page for any topic you could possibly think about. There's a mountain of uh, information out there. You, sometimes you just have to look for it. Uh, oh, Garrison Cavell says, HTTPS FCC.gov sites default uh, MDCL waivers. Uh, Ed's just made that where you can see it. So there you go. You can uh, look exactly how many folks are running MDCL out there. On that note, folks, I want to thank you all very much. Mike, I want to thank you. I know you're busy. You're out of sight in Chicago this week. So thanks for sticking around in the hotel at uh, noon. Noon. Go grab some lunch. <laughs> thanks for the uh, invitation, Jeff. It's always a pleasure. And on that note, folks, it's been wonderful. We are off next week and the week after. I'm going to take some downtime and spend a little with my family. It's not like I haven't been working from home for a year and a half, so I'm pretty sure they've seen all of me that they really want to some days, but now they're going to see a little more of me for a couple of weeks. We'll be back in January, I think on the second Tuesday in January. I forget the date. It's like the 10th, I think. Ed, Ed will correct me. You'll see it up on the website soon, but we hope to see you then. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye now.